Well, by my watch, we are at 9 o'clock. And I'm going to say hi and welcome to everyone. We're pleased to have you aboard this epic adventure for our province. This is the uh, first province-wide webcast or webinar or web conference that we've ever attempted or sponsored. And we trust that you will thoroughly enjoy being part of it. I hope you're comfortable and looking forward to a wonderful program. But first, let me thank everyone who's been involved in the testing and the coordination and the hosting uh, as we get started, because without your help, uh, we would not have been able to get this far. Particularly, I'd like to offer thanks to Julie Lytle, who is the Executive Director of Province One, for her very able assistance and direction as our consultant in this activity and for this event. She's been a, a very stable influence on everyone. The title of our program, oh, by the way, I'm Chuck Perfader. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the Executive Coordinator of Province Two. And the title of our program today is Stewardship is About Discipleship, Not Membership. I thought we all can see the difference, but if not, I hope you will by the end of the day. Several of us attended the TENS conference. TENS stands for the Episcopal Network for Stewardship. We attended their conference in Salt Lake City last summer. And we were very impressed by the content and also very impressed by the presenters. Hence, Paul Shackford and Bill Parnell and Claire Naismith and I got our heads together along with Jerry Kucher, and we decided that we wanted to try to bring this material to the province because we all need to have uh, our attitudes and our approach to stewardship enhanced. And so we put together a program and enlisted the help of two of the folks that did a couple of the best presentations at Salt Lake City and added one of our own stars, Jerry Kucher, uh, to put together this program. Today we will be bringing to you on the screen in your room the following presenters. Mary McGregor, who's face you see on the screen right now is the Director of Congregational Development in the Diocese of Texas. And she's coming to us from Houston. And she will cover the topic of becoming a change agent. I'll explain a little bit more in a minute about the schedule. But meanwhile, the second presenter will be the Reverend Timothy Dombeck, who is the Canon for Stewardship in the Diocese of Arizona. And he will be coming to us at 11 o'clock uh, from Phoenix on the topic of what gives with giving. And after that module is done, we'll have lunch. And following lunch, the Reverend Jerry Kucher, who is an author and a priest in the Diocese of Long Island, will present to us a program called From the Theory to Reality. Each presentation will last about 50 minutes to be followed by a question and answer session for 25 or so minutes. We truly encourage your offering questions if you have some. They are to be written on three by five cards that are available hopefully in every uh, room that we're presenting this. By the way, this is going out to about uh, 16 or 17 locations throughout the province, including I might mention the entire convention of the Diocese of the Virgin Islands is part of this program. Your questions back to that point uh, should be written on three by five cards and handed to whoever is going to type them into the chat box. They have to be typed into the chat box, which is part of the Adobe Connect screen. Uh, I think everyone in each location is aware of where the chat box is. And so you type your questions in. I will be seeing all of those questions as they're entered. And I will be trying to assimilate how they can best be presented to the presenter. And when the presenter's formal remarks are done, I will then ask of the presenter those questions that I feel are the most 
germane to the topic. Uh, you might have several that are on similar uh, points, and we'll gather them together as a single question. And then the presenter will take a few minutes to answer each of those questions. I don't know how many we'll get to, three, four, five, six, something like that, for a period of about 25 minutes. After we have the Q&A with the presenter, we'll go off screen for about a half an hour. And when we're off screen, the idea is that each local group in these 16 locations should spend the next, as I say, half hour, 30, 25, 30 minutes to discuss among themselves how best they think this topic's materials can be put to work in their own congregation or in their own diocese. We really want to have a lively conversation around the materials that have been presented, <laughs> and we hope that that will be helpful to each and every one of you. After these modules, there are three as I described, after these modules are completed, well, the first module with, with, with Mary and her presentation and, and the local conversation will be followed at 11 o'clock by, um, or 11.10 actually, uh, by Tim, uh, Timothy Dombeck, and we'll repeat that module where he will have about 50 minutes to make his presentation. There will be a Q&A period following his presentation and then a local conversation. At 12.55, we will break for lunch. Lunch is supposed to be provided at each location and we will rejoin the conference at 1.40, 20 minutes of 2, and welcome Jerry Kucher uh, to the screen. And Jerry will go through a similar process of 50 minutes followed by 25 minutes of Q&A and then a local conversation. That's how the day is set up. We really hope that this concept will be well received and that you each have an opportunity to uh, gain a great deal from these talented presenters. So, at this time, I welcome to the screen Mary McGregor from the Diocese of Texas. Mary, it's all yours. Thank you. It is absolutely indeed my pleasure to be able to present to all of you this morning. Um, I am a Texan, but for those of you up in the Northeast, you need to know that I was born in Nyack, New York, and my father uh, was a graduate of General Seminary, so I feel right at home speaking to you today. Uh, the title of my presentation is Becoming Agents of Change in a Changing World world. Um, I would really like to start by opening with this prayer, and I think it would be wonderful if everyone who is watching or listening say this prayer out loud with me. Let us pray. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things are made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I like that prayer uh, from the Book of Common Prayer on page 540. Uh, it is about change. And so today we are really talking about what does it mean to be a change agent. I would like to start um, by uh, talking about some definitions. The first one is change, to make or become different. 
You know, from the moment we were born until the moment we see God face to face, we're going to change. And God created the world to constantly evolve and to change. Now, those of us who are women, we do a really good job of trying to resist that change with a little makeup and the way we dress and maybe underpinnings. And um, those of you who are guys, you have your changes too. The change is just inevitable in life, and it's something that we must all have to deal with. So let's look at a definition for agent. An agent is a means, an instrument, one through which something is accomplished. I would like to say that uh, an agent is really a conduit. And in our context, an agent is a conduit for the work of God. So we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to be conduits for God's work in the world? Are we willing to be change agents? So let's look at the combination of those two definitions. A change agent in our context is an instrument through which people, churches, faith communities become different. Every one of us watching today have to wrestle with how God is using us in the world so that we might be able to be instruments for his mission in the world. So we have to think about how is God using us in our relationship? How is God using us in our churches? Uh, how is God using us in our communities? Uh, so that others may see God through us and that may see God at work so that all things may be transformed. For this is about transformation. And I'd like to read uh, from Romans 12, verses 2 through 3, what it says about transformation. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this is about transformation. And today we're specifically talking about um, transformation in terms of our understanding of stewardship. In my presentation, I will share with you some stories of transformation that I've personally uh, experienced in working with churches, where I work with all of our churches here in the Diocese of Texas. But I'm also going to teach you some theories about change that I think directly apply uh, to every circumstance of change. And I hope that in those theories, um, you will learn something and have some enlightenment about what does really transpire when we are faced with change? This is my favorite cartoon. For 57 years, it had been Mrs. Grumbling's seat in church. There they found her another victim of putrefaction. When I saw this cartoon years ago, it, it really made me pause because I had my favorite place in church, and it was in the left-hand corner in the second pew. Um, this really made me think about my comfort level in church and what my expectation was in terms of change and my willingness uh, to change. And so after seeing this cartoon, I decided, well, I'll no longer sit in the second pew, but I will sit in that quadrant of the church somewhere, and I'll move around each uh, Sunday. You know, we all want the church to be comfortable. We all want the church to be predictable. The world is changing at such a rapid pace that we seek out those places of predictability. Uh, we happen to be a part of a denomination that honors and values tradition. Uh, we love our liturgies. We love the ancient aspects of the way that we worship. We want to be able to come on Sunday morning and know what's going to happen and how long it's going to take. That's why we're Episcopalians. 
many people have joined us because we are predictable in our worship style. But that's the very thing that can keep us from being open to change. Uh, and so we have to be particularly uh, thoughtful about how we go about change and how we help others go about change. We are living indeed in um, exponential times of change. And I'd like to give you some examples um, that really testify to the very things that are happening in our world. We are seeing some of the fastest, most dramatic changes the world has ever seen. Did you know that the top 10 jobs in the United States in 2014 did not exist 10 years ago? That the U.S. Labor Department says that today's average 38-year-old has already had 10 to 14 jobs. You know, I have a son who's 36 years old, another son who's 33, and they think that if they stay in a job for a year or two, it's time to move on. That certainly was not the case in my generation and many of yours. For the first time in history, four generations of people are living and working together simultaneously in large numbers. That in and of itself takes tremendous adaptation um, and understanding and tolerance and patience with the different values of living generations. And that's a whole nother talk, but it's something that we really must understand if we are to become change agents in the church. Another fact, China will soon become the number one English-speaking country in the world. When I heard that, I was stunned. It's amazing. And the changes in technology are just unbelievable. Uh, one of the facts is that it took 38 years for radio, when it was created, to reach 50 million people. And it took only two years for Facebook to have an audience of 50 million people. Today, there are 175 million people in the world on Facebook every single minute of every day. There are 2.4 billion people in the world who use the Internet. And this one really, really astounded me. There are 372 billion searches on Google every year. Gone are the days of encyclopedia salesmen. Google has done away with them. So we are looking at exponential change. And in the church, we often debate um, some things about change. And so I want to ask this question, what impact will these changes have on our church? We've got to pay attention to what's going on. I don't know about in your diocese, but in my diocese and a number of our churches, there's a great deal of discussion about giving on credit cards, um, giving through automatic pay. What does it mean not to collect an offering anymore in our churches? Or if we do, how can we help people symbolically give so that we keep that as a part of our liturgy? I know in my own church, a young adult came to our associate just last week, and she said to her, um, I have to give through plastic. You're going to have to find a way for our church to offer up that opportunity. Now, to some of us, that is really stunning. Uh, to others of us, uh, especially in younger generations, it's a welcome change. I know that in some of our churches here in Texas, we even have kiosks in our uh, welcoming foyers where people can use their credit cards. Now, this may very well be a, a wave of the future, but I'm sure that there's some of us sitting in the audience today that this just makes them shudder. 
So how might we leverage these changes for good to positively impact the people and the faith communities we serve? Every one of us here listening today has to make a decision. Are we willing to let God use us? Are we willing to be those change agents, to ask the hard questions and to help foster in the changes in our churches that truly are coming? Or are we going to resist these changes and ultimately, um, ultimately be in a position where we're way behind the curve and, and we impact the ability for the mission of the church to move forward into future generations. This is a definition that I particularly like, a steward from Funk and Wagner's Dictionary, one who is entrusted with the management of property, finances, or other affairs, not his own. This is a secular definition of steward, but it absolutely has a spiritual overtone. For God has entrusted us with management of everything that God created. Uh, it's very easy to forget that. It's very easy, especially in American culture, to uh, think it's all about what we own uh, and to think about what are our needs. And it's very easy to hoard what we own. It's very easy to think that it is about scarcity, that we don't have enough. I mean, you can just look all around uh, first world countries in development and the consumer cultures that we have created to think that truly it is about what we own and that we have the right to own all this. But when we look at the spiritual side, we have to understand what does it mean to be a steward and how do we teach our people what stewardship is. I will repeat one more time. It is that God has entrusted us with the management of all that God has created that it is not our own. I like to tell the story of one of our clergy who did a funeral in New England uh, for a very wealthy family. And when he went up there to do it, uh, the siblings, the children of this gentleman, this wealthy gentleman who had died, were fighting the whole time around their inheritance. And this priest said all he could think of at the time as he saw the hearse drive up in front of the home was that this gentleman was moving on into the next world. And he didn't have a U-Haul trailer behind him in that limousine. Indeed, um, we were created out of dust and to dust we shall return. So we have a huge challenge in the church to help our people really understand what it means to be a steward. Now, Change agents. Uh, what makes a good change agent? As we consider our roles in the church and as leaders in the church, I think the highest thing we need to, the most important thing we need to really think about is our own self-awareness, um, our development in our own self-awareness. Each one of us has been given spiritual gifts. Um, I'd like to pause at this very moment, and if you are listening to this, I want you to say out loud two of your spiritual gifts. Go ahead and do that right now. I hope you took advantage of that opportunity. I will tell you I know my spiritual gifts. My spiritual gifts are leadership and administration and teaching and stewardship. These are four gifts that God has given me. And we all understand that spiritual gifts are to be used for the edification of the body of Christ, for the building up of our church, so that the church can be the vehicle through which God uh, can serve his mission in the world. 
So it's very important for you to identify your own giftedness. Next, I think, are talents. We all are born with some natural talents. God gave us these talents. We are to recognize the talents that we have, each of us individually. Claim them, not be embarrassed by them, not be afraid to say, I'm good at this. Next is our personality. Each one of us is so unique in that regard. Um, what is your personality like? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Uh, on the Myers-Briggs, do you understand Myers-Briggs typing, which is a tool to help us understand our personalities? Maybe we're sensing or thinking, perceiving, feeling, uh, judging. What, where are we uh, in terms of our personality? And what are our strengths? What are those things that we know we're good at, uh, that we're willing to say, I can do that, I know I'm good at that? And what are those areas that we're not so good at? Every one of us have those things. Uh, in this self-awareness, um, we are coming to understand how God made us and how God made us to serve. And if we will take the opportunity to be a change agent for God in the world. So these are incredibly important things to know about ourselves. The next I really feel very strongly about, which is our passion for ministry. Uh, you might not have ever heard that term, passion for ministry. Uh, it was first really talked about by Bill Hybels in Chicago at Willow Creek in the 1980s. And I was really intrigued by the work that that church did um, in helping individuals discern their God-given passion. Um, just gonna speak to that for a moment. Um, the theory is that, that God uh, instilled in our hearts a deep desire to do one of three things, um, to serve people, to serve in a role or function, or to support a cause. All three of these things uh, can touch us and change us and help us live into the person that God called us to be. So if you're interested in passion work, um, a lot of it's been done. Even Rick Warren through Saddleback has done work with passion. I encourage you to do some Googling and, and there's some reading out there that you can do about helping discern your God-given passion and helping others discern theirs. Because indeed, when we are about uh, our giftedness and our talents and abilities and our strengths and our passions, we are most able to serve. Now let's talk about the ability to self-differentiate. Those of you who are familiar with Edwin Freeman's work and his uh, seminal book, Congregation to Congregations, uh, Freeman was a Jewish rabbi who first took the theory of family systems and applied them to the church and to congregations on um, synagogues. And he said that as leaders, if we do not have the ability to self-differentiate, we're in deep trouble. Now what is to self-differentiate? Well, I just define it as that ability to uh, step outside of an emotional situation or a conversation and to be engaged in the conversation, but not to get emotionally hooked into that conversation. All of us as leaders know that when we get emotionally hooked into conversations in our congregations, we can easily say something that can derail an effort that we're trying to do as a leader. It can be extremely memorable and be very um, destructive. And so we as change agents, as leaders in our churches, need to have this ability to self-differentiate. And this takes practice. This isn't our human nature. Our human nature is to react and to react to triggers. So the next thing on this list is knowing what triggers you to defensively react. Peter Steinke is a, a Lutheran pastor who has written a number of books. He was a student of Friedman's. Uh, one of his books is on the resource list that I have for you today. 
and it is entitled Leading Congregations in Anxious Times. Um, and he talks about 13 different triggers that in his consulting over the years, and he is um, a premier consultant in conflict in congregations, he has found 13 triggers that really set off congregations to be anxious. And one of those triggers is money. And he talks about that in his book. And we all know that as leaders, when the subject of money comes up, the anxiety level just automatically raises in the room. So we need to know this is a trigger. And we need to know as change agents, are we able to talk about money in a way that really represents faithful stewardship? Now, I work with about 200 clergy. I love clergy. Um, they're, my, they're my partners in congregational development. But I know many of them who won't talk about money. Uh, there, there's a deep root there uh, when we are afraid to talk about money. Because money is just one of those things that God has entrusted us with to be good stewards of. Stewardship is uh, a hugely important subject for our clergy to be able to talk about with a comfort level and money, and, and the church, and the church being one of those things that is property that we are entrusted with to be good stewards of. So we need to understand ourselves well. We need to understand our fears. We need to understand um, that it is very important as change agents in the church to be able to talk about money. And I know that our next two presenters will get into some more practical aspects of how we go about talking about money and stewardship in our congregation. We have to have an ability to analyze and discern, to be able to step back and to look at a situation and to say, what's going on here? What's really happening here? Because if we don't have that ability to discern, to differentiate, stand back, and look at the situation, chances are we probably won't be very effective change agents. And then finally, what are our growing edges? What are those things that keep us up at night? What are those things that when we are working with our congregations, um, we know we need to grow in our ability to do so? Uh, we need to identify those things. They're extremely important. So I think um, I wanted to start out by really saying it's critical that as change agents we know ourselves and that we work on these different aspects of our own self-development. We all have a stewardship story. We need to be able to talk about our stewardship story. We need to be able to have a theology of stewardship. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my simple theology and about my own personal stewardship story. And it starts with knowing that God is love, that God is so gracious and so forgiving, and we are so undeserving of all the love and grace and forgiveness that God has poured out on us. And that Jesus is God made manifest in our lives. God sent us Jesus so that we could have a living human example of what God embodies. And so this is the first part of my own uh, theology and stewardship story. Next, I believe that God created us to serve. We were not here just to be about ourselves. God made us to serve each other. Jesus was our example for that. The church was created to serve. When I go in and I do work with churches, uh, one of the first questions I ask them is, how are you serving outside the walls of your church? 
Uh, churches are pretty good at serving inside. You know, we're about a lot of ministries that serve each other as members, um, and that's important. But the church was really created to be in the world, to serve the world. And so we need to help our people understand it is about serving. Uh, each one of us is called to serve and that God created us to serve. And then finally, God entrusts us, let me go back here, entrusts us to steward. I have an illustration here that's not coming up, but, but the thing that I remember in my theology is uh, that we are called to reflect God's love in the world. We are called to serve each other. And above all, we are called to steward and be good stewards of those things that God has entrusted us with. So it's a pretty simple theology I have. Um, I want to tell you about an incident that happened in my life that taught me uh, a lot about stewardship. Let's see, next illustration, here we go. It was 1997. I was in Philadelphia, uh, Deputy to General Convention. And we were five days into the convention. And it was, for those of you who've been to General Convention, you know how draining it can be, how tiring it can be. Uh, we had a Saturday afternoon off, and I decided to walk down to Independence Hall all by myself. I wanted to go see that historic place. And I went down, and um, it was a wonderful experience. And on my way back to the hotel, I encountered a beggar on the street. Now, you know, Philadelphia and the historic part of Philadelphia is very large, wide sidewalks. And I'm not proud to say that I thought, you know, if I walk by this beggar, he's leaning up against the wall, for indeed he was sitting on broken legs that were crippled under him with his crutches leaning against the wall. And I thought if I, if I walk down the curb, um, I won't look at him and I can just ignore him. Uh, as I was walking by, he yelled out, sister, stop and talk to me. And I literally thought, God, I'm here at General Convention. Uh, I know you're watching. So I decided to go over and to talk to him. So I knelt down. I'm a very tall woman. I'm about 5'11". He was sitting on his broken, crippled legs, and I knelt down so I could see his face. And he, I had a cross on, and he yanked my cross around my neck, and he pulled it out, and he said, are you a Christian? I was so taken aback by his comment that I said, yes. <laughs> and then I said, well, thought to myself, he's so bold to ask me, I'm going to ask him. And I said, are you a Christian? And he said, oh, yes. And let me tell you everything God has done for me. The first thing he did was to roll up his tattered sleeve of his T-shirt. And have you ever seen bones that have not been set that, it, that were broken? He had these broken bones in his arm, and he, and he said, I've had many broken bones in my life, and God has always healed me. And then he lifted up his tattered T-shirt to expose his chest, and he had scars all around his stomach area. And he said, I was once attacked by a gang, and they knifed me, but God saved my life. And then he went on to say, I've never been without a meal, and I've never been without a bed. Now, all I could think of was I was in Philadelphia, eating $15 lunches, staying in $150 night rooms at the Marriott, and that this man, in his immense gratitude for God's blessings in his life, had never had a $15 lunch, had never stayed in a Marriott, and yet he was still grateful. And then he went on to say, what's your name? And I said, Mary, and I asked him his name. He said, my name is Roscoe. And then he said, Mary, Will you come back and visit me? I'll be here on Monday, and I'm usually here in the afternoon. And I said, Roscoe, I'm, I've been brought all the way to Philadelphia from Texas, and I have to be in this very big meeting. 
just at that time and I won't be able to come. And then he said, well, then will you pray for me? And I said, of course I'll pray for you. And then I said, Roscoe, will you pray for me, especially while I am here this week in Philadelphia? And he said, yes, I'll pray for you. Well, by this time my tears were welling up and I was starting to cry and I put it, some few dollar bills in a styrofoam cup and we said our goodbyes. And as I was walking away, he yelled out, Mary, I love you. I need to tell you. That was a stunning moment. I felt like Saul on the road to Damascus. I knew at that very instant he was a messenger from God. I knew. So I went to my hotel and I just thought about all the things he had said to me that God had always provided for his need. He'd never been without. And that I needed to really realize how blessed I was in my life that God had always provided for me. So Roscoe was my greatest stewardship teacher. To this day, I think of Roscoe every day and the witness he was to me about stewardship. I need to tell you one time I had an opportunity to give a stewardship talk in my own church. And I told my congregation about my encounter with Roscoe. And after that quick little five-minute testimony after church, a gentleman came up to me. His name is Hollis. And Hollis said to me, Mary, I get it now. I get it. And every year when we have our annual campaign at my church, Hollis comes up to me and Hollis says, Mary, I just want to remind you that you helped me get what stewardship is. I want to tell you just briefly that Hollis is a contractor. And do you remember that television show, Extreme Home Makeover, where people donated houses and built houses for the needy? Hollis was one of those people. He donated a house to be built for a needy family. So indeed, helping our people understand what stewardship is um, is a hugely important mission for those of us as change agents. So let me talk to you a little bit about what is change? What do we know about change? I've done a lot of research on change because, frankly, the situations in our churches are all about the changes that we go through. And we, as change agents, really need to understand change. So let's look at that. I teach clergy. I teach vestries. I teach leaders these four important stages of change. And I want to go through them with you. Um, these are commonly experienced by our congregations as they go through change. And the first is denial. And in denial, our congregations, people in our congregations may exhibit shock or disbelief or just right out denial, they may be close to reality that we really don't need to face this change. And then they move into a stage called resistance. And in that stage, they may exhibit anger or grief or mourning or even defiance. Now, how do we move a group or an individual from being in a stage of resistance to a stage of discovery where they may be open to the possibilities, where they may be willing to explore with others what this change might mean. Um, perhaps it's a time of revelation of how this might be good for us, or it may be harmful for us, but it's, a, it's this time of discovery. Well, to move people from that stage of resistance to that stage of discovery takes tremendous communication. What is involved in that communication? A ton of listening, a lot of interactive conversation, dialogue, information exchange, sharing, time for people to think through these changes, and even prayer. So as they move to that third stage of discovery, we hope they will eventually move to that commitment stage. And commitment is the last stage and usually happens long after the change has happened. This is the time that we are resolved to the change, that we will adhere to the change, 
and maybe even believe that the change was a good thing, or maybe it wasn't a good thing, but we're committed to the change. Now, I would like to give the example of a church going through a capital campaign. Many of us who are change agents in our churches, in terms of stewardship, um, have dealt with occasional capital campaigns. And what is the first stage people usually go through? Well, they say, do we really need to do that? Let's give an example of uh, remodeling of a kitchen in a parish hall that might uh, mean we have to do $150,000 in fundraising. And they go, we've had this kitchen for 30 years. It's perfectly acceptable. There are appliances that work. Why do we need uh, to raise this money to change our kitchen and our parish hall? Uh, close to that reality in denial. Well, they find out the vestry said, well, we're going to go and we're going to do it. Um, and they may say, well, just see if I'm going to donate any money towards that capital campaign. I don't think we need to do this. Well, how do we move them to a place of discovery where this may be good? We listen. We listen to their angst over all of this. But more than anything, we share information with them. Perhaps for the first time they're learning that uh, the vestry and the mission group uh, in our church have decided that we're going to take on a feeding ministry. And in order to take on a feeding ministry that's going to utilize our kitchen, we have to bring the kitchen up to code. We have to make improvements. We have to totally remodel the kitchen. And for one or two days a week, we're going to use our parish hall as a feeding center. And our parish hall is solely inadequate for having people come in and to be fed there. So for the first time, they discover, oh, uh, oh, that is a significant ministry. Oh, well, maybe I will give money to this ministry after all. And then to move to that place of commitment, it's often a couple of years after all this work's been done, uh, thousands of people have been fed, and, and this very same person who denied the need to do this in the first place may be the person that says, it's one of the most wonderful ministries that we do. I, I think it's uh, awesome, and I'm really glad we did it. So I want you to burn in your brains these four stages of change to understand how critical they are and that we as change agents understand as we help people move through these stages uh, in stewardship. So what is the ministry of a change agent? I'm going to go through a little process that I created here for you. I'm going to do it in about the next 10 minutes, so our final time together so that we understand that it really takes some different steps. Um, and so the first is to identify the context. In what context are we working? And most of us, in terms of change agents, are working in the church uh, so that we understand the dynamics of our context. And then we understand that there's always a catalyst for change. I'll speak more to that in a moment. Then we need to facilitate conversation about that change and ultimately conversion uh, to that change. And then finally, we need to assure that there are leaders to help our congregations get through this change, that there are goals that we have set for this change, and there's always accountability. So let's speak to each one of these. First, identify the context. What is the contextual system in which you're serving as a change agent? Those of us who work with churches know that every church has a distinct personality. Every church has a DNA, just like we do as people. It's, it's very uh, distinctive, um, and often those of us in uh, church work say, when you see one church, you've seen one church, because the DNA is so different for different churches. Um, we need to understand the culture of that church. And uh, the culture of a church is often the systems and the traditions and the things we've done in the past that we hold in high value. I like to say that the culture of a church is just the way we do things around here. It's a simple definition. Uh, but we know there's just certain ways we do things around here. Um, so our history, 
what we value, even turnover rates and membership, uh, who are the persons of influence in our congregations, who are our perceived leaders, and this may go way beyond our vestry members or bishops committee members, who are the leaders in our church, uh, and then what is the history of giving in our church? Many churches are in a place of scarcity, always in want, uh, but then many of our churches come from a place of abundance and generosity. So if we put that on a scale, where would the church that we are working with be? Are they on the side of scarcity and neediness in a sense of not enough? Or are they on the other end of the spectrum of abundance and generosity? So we need to know these things about our contextual systems. Next, the catalyst. What is the catalyst for change? Change is not going to happen and be well received unless there is a catalyst. So what is a catalyst for change? Well, a catalyst can be an event. I put a picture here of the eye of a hurricane. I live on the Gulf Coast, and I have been through a number of Texas hurricanes. And I will tell you that it is a very physical catalyst for dramatic change. Um, so it can be an event. Another catalyst can be an individual, a person, a leader, or a group of persons who say, uh, we are going to go about this change. And then finally, there really has to be a sense of urgency or perceived need for change. Certainly a hurricane creates a sense of urgency. Uh, in my example about a church going through a capital campaign for a, uh, a new mission endeavor for kitchen and parish hall renovation, um, there has to be a perceived need um, that this is important. And this is urgent for us. So we have to identify the catalyst. So first we identify the context. Then we identify the catalyst. Next, we facilitate all that conversation, all that communication. We use lots of proven techniques. Here's a huge list of different ways that we can help a congregation or a group of leaders have those conversations. When a leader tries to force change, as a change agent, without facilitating conversation, they better be ready for a buzzsaw. Uh, people need the opportunity to hear, to listen, to talk. So these are just a number of different ways uh, that we can go about uh, that conversation. Uh, a couple in particular, the group prayer, Bible study, and reflection should always, always be a part of that conversation. Uh, many of us utilize surveys. Many of us are familiar with appreciative inquiry um, and small group work and open space technology and so on. So uh, just make sure that you do facilitate that conversation. And then we have to be about facilitating conversion. This is that final step. This is that commitment to the change. And it really needs to be holistic. It needs to be a mental, emotional, and a spiritual conversion to this change. This is about transformation. Uh, the scripture I read from Romans spoke to the need for us to have transformed hearts and minds. This is about our hearts, it is about our souls. And if we are not about the work of transformation, the changes just ultimately may not stick or may not be received well or have not been done well. We, the church, are about transformation. And I love what Bishop Duncan Gray of the Diocese of Mississippi says about transformation. And this is a quote, he says, Transformation begins to take place when we offer ourselves, our souls, our bodies, our dreams, our visions, our plans to Almighty God. And as we make our offering, we say, not, here are our plans, bless them, but rather, here are our lives, 
use them. It is in that offering that our lives are changed. I would go on to say that it is in our offering that our lives are transformed. One of the books I have on your resource list is called Immunity to Change. Uh, and this is something that it says about uh, transformation and change. Changing mindset needs to involve the head and the heart. Neither change in mindset nor change in behavior alone leads to transformation. Each must be employed to bring about the other. I'd like to share with you um, a couple of other things about change. So first, and again, I'm not sure why my example is not coming up. I have another cartoon here. It's not coming up. But it is a cartoon of a volunteer. It says change requires change leaders, not just volunteers. Uh, in our church, we're often looking for volunteers. It's the wrong approach. We need to be discerning who has the gifts, who has the talents, the abilities, and not just put them in a slot because we have a need. Uh, we are not so much volunteers as we are ministers. Um, I'm going to go to my grave talking about the ministry that we do as members of God's church and that we aren't just volunteers. So I encourage all of you to delete from your language the word volunteer. We're not the PTA, we're not the local library, uh, we are not some social organization. We are the church. There it is. We're in need of a volunteer. Uh, and the final theory I want to share with you, which I, it's the second one that I often talk about uh, and teach uh, leaders in the church is a theory called the diffusion of innovation. It was created by Dr. Everett Rogers in the 1960s. It was his dissertation work in the ability of people, a group of 100 people, to accept innovative change. Now, his particular research was done with corn farmers in Iowa and their ability to accept hybrid corn as a new type of seed. And this is what he found, uh, and, and it has been picked up by teachers who teach about leadership for the last 50 years, that in any group of 100 people, you're going to have only two who are visionaries or innovators, 2% out of 100. We always think they're more, but there really aren't that many. And then right behind them are 16 more. They're called early adapters. You might have heard this term used with technology. They're the first to buy new technology. Well, this is the theory that that term came from. So in any group of 100, you have two visionaries. You have 16 early adaptives who say, I get it. I get this vision. I'll get on board, and I'll help lead it. We hope that our leaders are part of that group. And then behind them is a group of 32. And this group are called the early majority. They're quieter. Uh, they want to know more, please tell me, communicate with me, help me discern, uh, but they're there. And then behind them is a group of 32 called late majority, and these are a little more negative. They say, I'm not sure I like this change. Uh, you're going to have to tell me an awful lot. You're going to have to convince me, but they're not very vocal about the change. And then behind them you have a group of 16 called laggards, and this is the most vocal group out of the hundred, and they're going to be very loud about their resistance to the change. And then finally, out of a group of a hundred, we had two percent. The theory calls them resistors. I call them saboteurs. Uh, in every congregation, we have people who will go out of their way to sabotage a, a change effort. I know you've probably experienced that. But I want us to reflect on who are the people we listen to when we go about trying to institute a change, what's usually the laggards and the resistors because they're so very loud. But if we take into consideration this theory, 
we have a very large group of about 80% with enough communication and enough of those techniques of listening in the conversation may get on board with that change. And so we need to remember this theory because we're so prone to be stopped dead in our tracks by our laggards and resistors. So finally, a couple of things I want to say to you, and then I want to be open to your questions. Um, we must assure, as change agents, as we're getting to the final steps in the process, that we assure that there are some goals, and that the goals include human development. Um, from the book Immunity to Change, it says it's more important to set a goal that requires human development and transformation and work to achieve than just to set goals that just make sense. So we need to be bold with our goals. Uh, and it calls for transformation. And it calls for our own human development. And then finally, we need to assure accountability. That's a word we hear a lot in secular circles. We're not so crazy about using it in the church. But really, we're all accountable to God in the end for our lives, for our willingness, for our willingness perhaps to be change agents in the church. So we must, we must set up uh, some accountability and personally allow people uh, to be held accountable uh, in gentle ways, in thoughtful ways. Uh, so it's important for us to do those things. One last slide, and an important theory. I'm not going to go into every step, but those of you who are involved in change, you probably are aware of John Cotter's Eight Steps to Change. This is a linear approach to change. Uh, these are his eight steps that make a lot of sense. The first one is establish that sense of urgency. We know that to be true. Uh, and then creating that God coalition that those of us as leaders in the church coming together and so on. Uh, after this work, he was Harvard Business School published this work uh, maybe 20 years ago. And Cotter came back after about 13 years of teaching these, these steps, and he said, you know, I need to tell you I left something out. And the thing that I left out uh, was that I did not understand the role that healthy relationships were played in the ability for people to accept change, uh, that the guiding coalition must foster healthy relationships. I think that speaks directly to the church. We are about uh, being in relationship with each other and being in relationship with God. So finally, a quick review before your questions. If you're going to set out to be a change agent in terms of stewardship, Think about your ministry. First, identify the context that you're working in, the catalyst that has to be present for that change. You are to facilitate conversation and to facilitate the conversion that needs to happen in the mind and the heart. And then finally, assure that there are leaders uh, to be working on this change, to set some goals for that change, and to provide for accountability. So at this time, I'd like to address your questions, and I, I see quite a few of them here. Let me see. OK, I'm just going to start with the ones that I can see uh, from New Providence. Let, uh, let's see, they're disappearing. How often should we update vision and strategy? I think it depends on the comprehensive nature of vision and strategy. I would say we need to look at it annually, and maybe every, uh, depending on the size of a congregation, um, a smaller congregation, let's say, of attendance of 75 or less on Sunday, uh, that that be a strategy and a vision for one to three years, um, and that we review this vision and strategy, and that we Make sure we're making progress or, or make the adjustments that need to be made. If you're a larger congregation of 100 or more on Sunday, your strategy 
uh, some will be short-term strategy, one year, but it could go as far out as five years. But you go any further out than five years and you've lost the people. People are now adjusted to uh, fast changes in our culture and churches have to adapt and change and review those things and be willing to change. Um, another question. Uh, comments on these funding apply to change in the church? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, these are my guides as I work with 151 congregations and help them make internal changes and help them understand processes for change that are necessary. Can you give some examples of human development goals that might be involved in a capital campaign? Sure. <laughs> a human development goal might be their own theological understanding and articulation of what it means to be a steward as part of a capital campaign, um, that they have involved in a capital campaign, significant Bible study, uh, the ability to have conversations with each other about, about our church and that we are called to steward it and to come to some new understanding of stewardship, that human development goal is really a theological, spiritual goal that absolutely applies. What do you mean by open space technology? Well, open space technology is a technique. Um, and if you will Google open space technology, you will probably find the technique online very easily. But basically, it's a process by where people gather in a room, they decide uh, the different things they want to talk about, and then they break into different groups to talk about those subjects. Um, it can be utilized with a small group of 25 people, or I've seen it used with 2,000 people. The smaller the group, the fewer the topics that will be talked about. Uh, in the group that had 2,000, they had 75 different breakout groups talking about 75 different things they wanted to talk about. So it's mostly a process for conversation about those things that you are most interested in talking about. I encourage you to Google it. What, let's see here. Um, what is the best process to anchor new approaches in the culture? Well, first of all, you need to understand the, the processes that I taught in this um, time. Um, we've got to realize that our church, any church, has a distinct culture. And if we just go about change in a business-like way, applying this process, and never talk about the mission of the church, we've missed the point. To establish and anchor new, new approaches uh, must involve the very things we value unapologetically. Bible study, conversation, sharing of personal stories about stewardship, listening to people's fears about money, um, listening to each other helps us build our courage. And as we build that courage, we begin to anchor uh, changes in our culture. Um, we grow in our maturity, in our spiritual maturity. Um, you know, the Episcopal Church, for the longest time, was really afraid to talk about our spiritual lives, to share our faith. Uh, I've even heard people say, I became an Episcopalian, so I'd never have to talk about my faith again. Um, boy, what a mistake uh, that is, that we have fostered that. Uh, one, one thing that's really interesting about younger generations is they have a fearless nature about talking about their questions and about talking about their fears and about talking about their faith. I think this is a very um, wonderful thing that is happening in the church, uh, that we as an older generation learn from them, that we have the courage to say, I believe in God and this is why I know why. And this is how God has acted in my life. And this is how God is 
then I uh, use my congregation as a vehicle in my life for my own spiritual development and spiritual maturity. So this is all part and parcel to the changes that we need to anchor in our culture in the church. How do we get the conversation started when faced with a stuck congregation? I think we get the conversation started by teaching. I think we have to go back to our roots with the mission of the church. And we can go back to the catechism in the back of the Book of Common Prayer about what is the mission of the church, what does this really mean? And then we ask questions. And we have small group conversations. It's very safe to have conversation in groups of two or three, much less threatening than in a large group conversation or even a conversation among 10 or 12. Because when you have those conversations, it's the most vocal, the most extrovert that dominates those conversations. So you get a congregation unstuck by teaching, by communication, by opportunities for conversation, and to make those opportunities as safe as possible. Scroll up to the other questions. All right, I'm going to try. Let's see here. Why do we need to change our understanding about stewardship? Um, if you have a well-defined understanding of stewardship that is spiritually grounded, you don't need to change it at all. I would say there's a huge need, people in our churches, to be able to define and understand what stewardship is. Because they usually equate stewardship with money. And that's all they equate it with. And that takes us back to a place of scarcity. Um, our churches are meant to be places where people grow. And I would say they cross the entire spectrum of being afraid uh, that they don't want to deal with what, is, what does God mean about me being a steward of everything God created and, and entrusted with me in my life. I would hazard to guess that most people in our churches cannot give you a definition of stewardship. So we need to start right there. That's where the conversation starts. And if you have a mature congregation who understands it, bless you, you're very fortunate. Is it because the tr traditional understanding is no longer working? Um, I would say yes, indeed. And that's born out of American culture, I think, of, of a, a great uh, deal of um, a focus on consumerism. And so people join into, uh, born into the cultures of great consumerism uh, need to be taught. And so it's really important. Is it because the traditional under, okay, let me see, New York. Uh, will this presentation be made electronically? Yes, I understand we are. Uh, let me move down a bit. Please say something about the um, tension. tension. Handling internal structural change uh, congregation is becoming and the consideration of using gifts, congregational energy outside in the neighborhood. Okay, very good. I think they go hand in hand. I think we don't do one without the other. And those churches, as they change their internal structures to address, the only reason why you work on internal structure is to address the mission of the church. How well are we doing this mission in terms of, it can be everything from worship to fellowship to pastoral care to stewardship to mission outside of this church. Um, and that we are called to all of these things. And so we work on internal structures that support these things. I will, t I will tell you I'm seeing dramatic changes in internal structures. Um, if we are married to old structures that aren't working anymore, get rid of them. Um, that's a hard thing to do because when you get rid of those internal structures, and I'm talking of things like committees where people don't function well, and leaders who don't show up, and, and work that never gets done, these are all indicators that this is just not working. Then we need to think of new ways uh, to come together. 
I'm a great believer in task forces that have temporary lifespans, maybe six months, a year. They take on a challenge and then they disband. Um, I would tell you I've done a lot of studying of large churches, mega churches outside of the Episcopal tradition, and they are renowned for having creative ways that people come together uh, to make decisions and to get missions done. Uh, of course, many of them have committees, but many of them have done very creative things that don't look like traditional committees. So I encourage you to think about what are some alternative ways that we can establish structure in our church uh, in order to achieve the mission of the church. Um, consideration using gifts, energy outside the neighborhood. I think every single member should be challenged with doing mission work outside the walls of the church. I think the church needs to provide opportunities for mission. Um, I know that my own church, just this last Saturday, had an environmental cleanup of a local bayou where a lot of churches came together. We partnered with other churches. And 100 people showed up to clean the trash out of the local bayou. Um, our members at my church were challenged to spend their Saturday morning to go do that as part of their uh, stewardship of God's environment. And the church, whether it does things on its own, it can have involved with um, setting up partner churches in third world countries, perhaps they send teams to help drill water wells or to install solar in third world countries or to just visit um, congregations that are in partnership with in other countries, it gets us outside of ourselves. And we have to do that work. And when we don't do that work, we're missing a critical piece of the work that God has called us to do. Okay, I'm gonna pull down. Let's see if I have some more questions here. Is lack of biblical literacy and disinterest a problem for developing a mindset of stewardship? Absolutely. And we should not be embarrassed to expect our members to do Bible study. Uh, our lack of literacy in the Episcopal, biblical literacy in the Episcopal Church is embarrassing. Uh, and then sometimes we think, well, we have to be a part of a formal program like EFM in order to have that biblical literacy, I would say EFM is a wonderful program. There are other programs out there we can use. Uh, but I would say let's just jump in. Um, there's a program that's now being used called the Bible Challenge in 365 Days, which was uh, set up by one of our Episcopal clergy who lives in Pennsylvania. You can just Google Bible Challenge. And it comes up in how we can challenge our members in the Episcopal Church uh, to read the Bible in a year. Um, a number of our churches have taken on this challenge, and that's awesome. It's a great start. Um, foster Bible studies in your churches. Have small groups in your churches to Bible studies. And I don't just mean the Tuesday morning Bible study where five people show up. We have to raise the expectation as leaders that we will study the Bible. I'm really kind of excited that, you know, I visit our churches regularly. I'm in different churches almost every Sunday. That a number of our Episcopal churches now have Bibles in the pew. And a number of our clergy are saying uh, a scripture reference during their sermons and, and saying, pick up your Bible in your pew and turn to this. Uh, this is no longer the bailiwick of evangelical churches in America. We have many of our Episcopal churches who are now doing this. This is all part of biblical literacy and getting comfortable with the Bible. And we also have to be able to say, if you don't know where that verse is, it's on page 965, so don't worry about that. So we don't have to apologize for it, we just need to encourage. Next question. We hear that the nuns say that churches only want warm money. Make clergy me diffident about speaking about money. Thoughts? 
The nuns, and I understand your comment about the nuns. I know research has shown that that's a large category of people who have no affiliation with any, any church, any uh, religion in America. Um, I would say that we've got a lot of work to do with everybody else. The nuns will always, if they choose not to be a part of the church, um, that's their choice. The, the rest of us, we got plenty of people who have a desire to know God and that expect our clergy to help us know God. I've done some recent research on some statistics in America, and it said that 59% of Americans believe in God um, and want to know more about God. Now, we only have between 35 to 40 percent who claim they're in church once a week or affiliated with the church, but that leaves an awful lot of people who are looking to our clergy to help us understand what is stewardship from a godly perspective. Um, what does it mean to have this money? And, you know, the interesting thing is that I have found that when people get it, like Hollis got it, um, that their lives change and that they become generous people and that generosity brings them tremendous joy. And so the challenge for our clergy often when, when we hear all the reservations about talking about money and, and when I hear vestries say, well, well we, we don't let our rector know who pledges in this place. I'd say right back to those vestries, you are coming from a place of fear. You are coming from a place of fear. Now, how can we work on that fear and, and sense of scarcity to a place of recognizing God's abundance in this church? So my time is wrapping up. Um, I think that's about it for me. I see Chuck. Got one more there, Mary. Pardon? I got one here from the Virgin Islands. How do you present change to your congregation? I think you present, the leaders have to present change to your congregation. And I believe that it comes from your spiritual leaders. Uh, it comes from a unified group of leaders who say, um, God calls us to change. And these are the things we're thinking about and then bring them into the conversation. Because without ownership and without that communication, you know, they can just strike on to denial and resistance. So we say we feel God is calling us to change something about our congregation. And we believe this, we've talked about this as leaders and we wanna hear what you have to say. Uh, undergird that with uh, scripture, undergird that with faith, and encourage courage um, and trust in God that God will be with us through this. And you'll be surprised how people will come along. Uh, our fear, our natural anxiety around change because it is a built-in physical reaction for us as human beings can take over if we don't let our faith in God, our trust in God, really lead us as change agents. I guess that's about it. Mary, great thanks and much applause for a wonderful presentation. We appreciate it very much, your very talented presentation in, in the way that you present it. The terms were excellently received. There were other questions, unfortunately, we don't have time for, but we'll gather them up and see that you get them, and if you have a chance to respond to us by email. We'll get them shared with everyone. I will definitely do that. And for those of you, I believe you have my resource list. It's a single page handout. It has the books I reference. It has website addresses. It has media sampling for stewardship, all around stewardship and leadership. And my email address is also on that list. So I encourage you to write me. I'm happy to address any other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. You're now, for those of you out at... Bye-bye.